Well, I want to thank you for joining me today for our Bible study. Let's take the opportunity to begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for joining us, meeting with us this day, through your word, through the gift of your Holy Spirit. Inspire us, open up our hearts, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do something a little bit different for Bible study. We had been taking a look, obviously, at the continuous readings in Genesis and, of course, Exodus, and we're done with that section right now. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up the church year. This last Sunday was the penultimate Sunday in the church year. This coming Sunday will be Christ the King Sunday. The lessons tend to deal with the end of ages, where Christ brings what is far away near to us. Now, oftentimes when we hear the end of ages, we think of cataclysmic ending of the world and the universe. That's not what that word means. It means bring something far away near to us. What is good? Time with God. Being in God's presence has now been brought near to us. That's what the end times is. So I want to transform your way of thinking about the end times. However, some of the lessons leading up to the end times can be a little bit catastrophic and difficult to deal with. Uh, so Jesus is talking with his disciples and, 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 and again delivered another very harsh message he wants to make sure his disciples do not become like the scribes and the Pharisees. This was the lesson that we read for Sunday. The problem, I didn't want to oppress everybody with this really harsh lesson on Sunday. And so I'm going to oppress you with it tonight in our Bible study. I hope we'll try to cushion the blow a little bit. Jesus is pretty harsh here today. So again, Jesus took his disciples, wanted to teach them. This is shortly before he was to be crucified, and he was giving them a big warning. Do not be like the scribes and the Pharisees. So, let's go on to this passage, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said, For it will be like when a man goes on a journey, and he called his servants and entrusted them with his property. One he received five talents, another received two, another one, each according to his ability. The master went away, and when he, he would receive five talents, went at once and traded with them, made five more. So also the one who had two made two more talents, but the one who received one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Hmm, who do you think that one is? Oh, that's the scribes and Pharisees warning Disciples, don't you be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay, let's go on. We'll figure out what that means in a minute. His master, uh, and he would, uh, the master that came and, uh, and received, uh, the man who had received five talents came forward and brought forth five more talents and said, Master, you delivered me five talents, I'm bringing you five more. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered me two. I've brought you two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. Uh, I, I, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, one who received one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a harsh man. You reap where you did not sow, and gathered where you did not winnow. So I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the ground. Here you are, what is yours? But his master answered him, You are a wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not winnowed. Then you ought to have invested money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from me, give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and you will have abundance from him who has not. Even what he has will be taken away. Cast this worthless servant out into the art of darkness, and where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> Here ends the lesson. Okay. Harsh lesson for today. I'm encouraging if you'd like, there's a sermon handout attached to today's Bible study. You're welcome to pull it out. I want to make sure that you get some of the details that I'd like to include in the lesson for today. It is really important that we take this lesson within its larger context of, again, Jesus speaking to his disciples after 
He has confronted the scribes and Pharisees. And we've got to figure out why was Jesus so upset? What is it about him being so upset with the scribes and Pharisees? He doesn't want his disciples to be like them. Don't be like the scribes and Pharisees. And we also have to understand that there's a context of Matthew, or whoever it is that wrote this. I know it's associated with the, the gospel of uh, Matthew, with the, uh, with the disciple of Jesus. But that's actually a tradition that started a couple hundred years after this book was written. We don't really know who wrote this book, to be frank. But nevertheless, we think it was written about 70 AD, and we know that the gospel writer has his particular context. He very might, likely may have been Matthew or one of the disciples. He doesn't want, like what he's seeing going on in the leadership of the church, he wants to make sure that the church remembers this lesson that Jesus taught so that they not be like the scribes and Pharisees. Don't be like them. So context is important. If you're looking at the handout for today, and you notice again I say context or contexts with an S there. We cannot interpret the Bible any way we choose because it leads to abuse. We have to keep them in its context. And there are at least four contexts to this lesson. Got to get that S on there. You've got obviously the original context when Jesus actually spoke this lesson. You again have the context of Matthew, how he heard this lesson. You have the context of the Matthew, the Gospel writer, when he wrote this lesson 40 years later. And of course you've got the canonical context where this book was finally pulled into the scripture as we know it today. There's a lot of different contexts. The more we try to understand these contexts, the better understanding of why we why we, we get to an understanding of why this lesson is important, why the church wanted to make sure that we got this lesson and why it's passed on to us. So obviously, this lesson applies to us. It's a warning to us. Don't be like the scribes and Pharisees. We can point our finger and say it's all those people out there. Jesus is talking to us. We are the continuation of the church. We are now the leadership of the church. Don't be like the scribes and Pharisees. Well, what is it about the scribes and the Pharisees that upset Jesus so much? Huh. Look at to whom this lesson is directed. Remember, Jesus is speaking against those people who have been the backbone of the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees. You already mentioned that. We already mentioned that Matthew, uh, the gospel writer, and the account of this uh, Jesus' life was written 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. As I said to you, it's a warning to Jesus' disciples. Do not become the very thing that you have opposed. See, it's so easy to laugh at people and say, oh, those stupid scribes and Pharisees, and yet we are exactly like them. Okay? So what is it about the scribes and Pharisees that angered him so much? You see, they were lazy servants. They were not faithful with the gift that God had given to them. And this is a story that gets played out over and over and over in the scripture because we get a, you know, the, God wants to make sure we just keep getting banged in the head with how stupid we people are. We do the same thing over again, make the same mistakes. You know, if, if you've ever, ever read a uh, book in First and Second Kings, and he did what was evil in sight, and he did what was evil in sight of the Lord, and he did what was evil in sight of the Lord, and he did what was evil in sight of the Lord, again, over and over and over and over again. Same thing with the judges. You know, the judges made the same mistakes over and over again. The people made those same mistakes. They wanted a king. We want a king. We want a king. Okay? All of the stupidity that they did, uh, they were called to be the light to the nations. They weren't light, the light to the nations. They surrounded themselves with power and wealth and greed. Solomon did this, for goodness sakes, with power, wealth, and greed. Okay? We can't seem to think of Solomon as a wise man. Well, he was early in his life, but he became a greedy, selfish pig. Okay? And set the nation of Israel to destruction. This was played out over and over again. We see the same thing in the scribes and the Pharisees. We just see the same thing in the church today. We have not been faithful with what God has given us. We get wealth. We get 
the blessing of life. We get the blessing of each other and we use it in a very selfish manner because we're greedy, lazy, selfish pigs. Okay? This is what the lesson's about. All right. It is central in Jewish theology. And the reason why these stories get played out over and over again is to remind us that we are called, as we've been blessed, we are called to be a blessing. But religious leadership withholds that blessing from people for a variety of reasons. Because they want power. They want control. They want to be the gatekeepers. They want your money. All right? We got preachers on TV. Oh, give me money and then you'll get your blessing. Bull crap. Sorry to be so strong about this, but I'm sorry. The healing of God is a free gift. And if you got to send somebody money before you get a healing, that person is an evil. Not a messenger, not a messenger of God. They're evil. They're wrong. You give the blessings of God for free, okay? Because you've been blessed by God. I'm, I'm serious about this. If you've got a preacher and you're listening to a preacher on TV and he's telling you you've got to send him money, seed money to prove your faithfulness before you're going to receive a blessing from God, walk away because that's never how Jesus... Jesus never, did you notice? Jesus never, ever, 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 ever went up to somebody who needed to be healed and said, oh, give me money first as a proof of your faithfulness. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He just blessed them. And, oh, by the way, he never asked for money afterwards either. He was just giving as he had been blessed. This is what religious leaders do. They like power. They like to put you in your place. Well, you need to change first before you can actually be a part of this fellowship. Oh, come on. We were loved while we were yet sinners. You see what religious leaders do? We withhold God's blessing to maintain our position, our title, our power. This is what Jesus was so ticked off about. <sighs> Letter B under number three. Scribes and the Pharisees excuse their behavior by couching their stinginess in religious terms. Scribes and the Pharisees were using the Bible in a very abusive manner taken out of context to hold up their legalisms and uh, making legalisms out of stories of God's grace. Same thing we do in the church today. Oh, we do this all the time in the Church of Jesus Christ. We take stories and lessons out of context in order to enforce our bigotries and our hatreds against other people any way we can to maintain the status quo, to maintain our power, to maintain our control, to maintain our wealth. This is what Jesus is so angry about. So as we look at it today, who are the equivalent to the scribes and the Pharisees? As I told you, speaking to you and me, if you're not feeling your toes being stepped on right now, then maybe you're not listening closely enough because Jesus is talking to you and me. This lesson only has meaning when we find a con con contemporary construct similar to the one of the scribes and Pharisees. And you and me, we're it there, baby. I'm in it with you because Jesus is talking to me. So people within the church who use every excuse in the book to be lazy and not volunteer to fulfill their calling. Oh, uh, you know, I, I tell you what, I get this all the time. People come to me and I'll say, look, I need some help with this. And they come up with an idea and say, here's an idea, Pastor, you go and do it. They want me, I, I, I cannot tell you how many times this happens to me. People come up with the most wonderful ideas, but they expect me to do it. Because they're not going to do it. Why should I do it? Well, because you're a member of this church. You're called to use your gifts and your talents. I can't tell you how many people have so many great ideas for me to do. Okay? Stop being lazy. Get off your butt. If 
God is putting her, I actually had, no, in a good side, side of the story. I actually had a woman one time who was frustrated by some of the mistakes that were in the bulletin. And she might even be listening here tonight. And uh, she just said, oh, I got so frustrated. And you know, see this mistake and this mistake. And it's just, well, I was doing the bulletins. Nobody else was doing it. We'd lost our person doing the bulletin. She said, I was going to come and complain to you, but then I realized the reason why it annoys me so much is because maybe God is putting on my heart that I have to do it. Now that's faithfulness. That's faithfulness. Right on. Okay? Second bullet point. Those who've been blessed by God but are stingy in blessing other people. Oh, the rich. <laughs> How are the worst? You know, sometimes poor people are so much more generous than rich people. You know, uh, what is it, Rockefeller, who one time was asked, how much money is enough? He, he said, one dollar more than what I have. It's always one dollar more. You never are wealthy enough in his book. For a person who struggles to get by, when they have a bit of excess and there's somebody in need, they give generously. It's amazing. Sometimes they give even out of their lack. It's like the woman who came and, was, uh, and Jesus noticed her offering. She had not even enough food to eat for the day, but she gave her money to eat for the day to be a blessing to other people. Now there's faithfulness, okay? Those who've been blessed richly by God but are stingy in giving their blessing to others. Jesus talking to them. Those who build fortresses around their prized traditions in order to guarantee that the church, their congregation, always runs as it is always run in order to protect their own turf. You know, I remember when we first got new members at our congregation back when I first came here, they're a threat. Make no mistake, if you've got an aging congregation and you add new people into it, it is an explosive dynamic that can rip a church apart. Every aging, ailing congregation that is shrinking says, we want new members, and then they get new members and it nearly tears them to pieces. Because what they really want is they want bodies in the pew to make it look good again, but they want those bodies in the pew to shut up and do exactly what we want you to do. Because we want the church to run the way it's always run. Well, the church running the way it's always run got you into the condition that you're in right now, right? Maybe you do need to change, but that brings some explosive dynamics inside of congregation. We had, back when we first got some of our first members, uh, one of them actually made it on the council. And oh my goodness, that created such a stir. What right? They have to shut up. They have no right to say anything. Well, where does it say in the Constitution that a new member who's been dutifully elected onto the board has to keep their mouth shut? because they were actually recommending that we start a second worship service, a more contemporary service. It created an explosive dynamic. All right? Those are scribes and Pharisees, not the new members, but the members who want to keep the new members in their place. Okay? Because we're trying to defend our traditions. It's also the reason why I didn't preach on this lesson on Sunday, because they felt like people had been burdened too much. I'm not going to follow our traditions of reading the lectionary just because we have to do it. No, I don't have to do it. I can choose to read from any lesson I choose to. The lectionary is a guide. The lectionary is here to serve me. I'm not here to serve the lectionary. I'm not here to serve the liturgy. The liturgy is there to serve us. Our hymns are not here to, we're not here to serve the hymns or do duty to the hymns. The hymns are here to serve us. See how this works? You have to be careful of our traditions. Those, next bullet point, those who use the God excuse for the behavior. There's nothing that drives me more crazy than somebody says, well, God told me to do this. So you're telling me I'm not allowed to question your understanding of what God has told you. This is a reason why we are in the context of the church. I have every right to question what you think God has told you, but some people use it as well. That's the end of the conversation. God told me that's it. No, if you're wrong, then maybe God didn't tell you that's something you wish God had told you, and you're using it as an excuse to be able to do your bigoted, selfish behavior, whatever it might be. They are protecting their understanding of God by 
use, by refusing to participate in open and loving debate. So I might say sometimes, I think God is telling me this. I think God is directing us this way. What do you think? But whenever, hard and fast, God told me this, this is the way we're going to do it, bull. If you're not willing to open up your understanding of what God has told you to critical debate, then God didn't tell you it. Sorry. The church should have its say and should be able to evaluate and confirm or reject what it is that you think God has told you. All of these things must be open for dialogue and debate based on what the scripture says and based on what God is telling us. It's never what God is telling you, it's what God is telling us. We excuse so many rude and horrendous behaviors that God has told me this. Stop using the God excuse. Lastly, those who align themselves with power, hmm, right-wing, left-wing Christians, in order to enforce what they believe is the will of God for other people. Okay, they're totalitarians. You know, we actually had a pastor friend of, of mine who posted on his Facebook page. He said, I can't wait for this election to be done so we can figure out whether we're going to have a right-wing totalitarian or a left-wing totalitarian for government. <laughs> and I said, right on, because that's the way our right-wingers and left-wingers are right now. They don't want to share power. They don't want transcendent answers. <clears throat> they don't want to understand that half of this country is feeling about this way about this country and half the world country this way. They want to enforce their will upon everybody, regardless of the fact that 50% of the country disagrees with them. That's called totalitarianism, by the way. And that's evil. And you know what? Christians excuse their right-wing or left-wing behavior on, well, this is what God wants us to do. It's all about left-wing social justice, and that's the will of God, and we're going to oppose it. Yes, it's about justice. Okay, true. But justice doesn't impose its will and its way upon everybody. And who's to say that your way of doing it actually is God's way? All right, be a little bit more humble about it. Just because it looks like justice, or you think it looks like justice, doesn't mean that it is. In the right way, it's all about morals. Well, if it's all about morals, then, well, I'm getting really bad. Why not? Then why did you elect a president with such low morals? You know, you guys were all over President Clinton and about his lack of morality, and look at the president that you elected. You would have never elected this man had he been a Democrat. What in the heck is wrong with you people? You take your religion and try to support a particular political point of view that has nothing to do with Jesus. It's the politics of the world. We get all bent out of shape of this. None of this is the will of God. Sorry, right-wing Christians, left-wing Christians. You don't represent Jesus. There's no such thing as a benevolent dictator Someone has always oppressed right-wingers and left-wingers for the greater good in your vision of this world. You don't represent Jesus. Good golly. I'm going to get hate mail for that. So what can we learn? Last part of our handout for today. This lesson is ultimately about our attitude towards God and one another. Rather than taking a look at other people and evaluating all their shortcomings and how they fall short, we need to be evaluating our own shortcomings. You know, it's an old saying, if you're pointing your finger at somebody else, remember you got three pointing back at you. Okay? You need to be taking a look at your attitude. That's what this lesson's a reminder of. So that we become more proficient as loving servants of God. We are to evaluate our own behavior. Don't be envious of others who've been given much. And don't also devalue the gifts that you have received from God. Because remember, there was the one who received five talents, one who received two, one who received one, each according to their abilities. Well, if you're the person that feels like you've got one, don't devalue it as though it's unimportant. You know, it, 
I always say I think the most important people in the world are the people who clean our toilets. I, don't, I did that for, for over 10 years. I cleaned toilets. I cleaned floors. I worked for a company called Service Master for 10 years. Helped me get me through college and through uh, seminary. I'm very grateful for Service Master. I'm grateful for the opportunity. I learned a lot of responsibility. I also learned, a, oh, pardon me, also learned a little bit of humility with that. You realize how people devalue the gift that you have. But one of the things I learned is that these janitors, these people who clean your toilets, most important people in the world. They keep you healthy, they keep you safe, they do it behind the scenes, and yet you devalue what they do. You go to a baseball game and a baseball player that you just saw strike out for the fourth time that day and your team lose, that guy get, get, is getting paid $20 million a year. He got paid more for showing up to the ballpark that day than any one of the janitors do in an entire year. And yet, you're going to go back and watch that baseball team again play. You're going to go watch that $20 million uh, baseball player play a game again, even though he struck out four times in a row. However, if you go to the baseball stadium and you sit down in your seat and it's sticky from the night before from the coke that somebody had dropped on there and you can't move your feet because they're sticking and sque squeezing all over and you walk into the bathroom and it's so gross and so filthy and so dirty that you just feel like you're getting germs just walking in there, you're never coming back to the baseball stadium, are you? So here's my question. Who is the most important person? The $20 million a year baseball player? Or that janitor who makes $10 an hour? We have just a stupid way of evaluating value in this world. The most important person is the most humble. That janitor, who you don't even see it, whose gift that you devalue. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is stop devaluing the gift that you've been given. It might seem humble compared to that that other people's have, but it might be the most important gift of all. When you've received a gift, use it. Take a risk with it in order to create something bigger and better. Don't just bury it in the ground. Okay? Don't withhold it. That will also expose you to the potential... Uh, a, a failure, and that's okay. It's better to invest and fail than to not invest at all. I wish that Jesus told a fourth person in the parable who had invested the money and lost it all, and okay, well, at least he tried. I mean, it's fantastic. Those who are successful, here's the kind of scary thing. If you're successful in using what God has given you, God is going to dump more responsibility upon you. Sorry, but that's kind of what Jesus says. But those who are lazy who don't take any risks, who don't use the gifts that God has given them, what they've been given will be taken from them. The bigger tasks that we tackle, the better we get at tackling, therefore, take on the challenging tasks in life that God has put before you. Because you're never going to improve your outcome without practice, hard work, and risk. Jesus is talking to you and me. See, this lesson wasn't Jesus just pointing the finger at the scribes and Pharisees. He was talking to his disciples. We are now the forebears of the, or we are now the ancestors, pardon me, uh, the descendants of the disciples. This lesson is spoken directly to us. We need to not be like the scribes and Pharisees. We need to value the gifts that God has given us. We need to invest these in a way that they multiply and bless the world. If our only purpose is to stay in our buildings and our congregations and hoard it all for ourselves, we just aren't doing Jesus right. Let's go be a blessing with God, what God has given us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would bless us while you have blessed us. Help us to acknowledge this blessing and help us therefore be a blessing. I think the church has been, we've been selfish putzes. Many congregations during this season of COVID have been selfish putzes. All they cared about is getting back together to worship and spreading on this COVID because they're so, so belligerent. They don't even wear masks. God, we've been bad stewards of what you've given us. 
We've been bad representatives of the love of Jesus Christ. We've represented political solutions, right wing, left wing. Oh my goodness, none of them represent Jesus. We need to represent your love because that's what you've given to us in abundance. So we pray, God, that you would touch and transform our lives, that we might be your loving servants. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Told you it was a bit of a harsh lesson. The good news is coming soon. We do have Advent around the bend. God is going to bless us with that hopefulness of that new year, that new season. So until that time, may God continue to touch and transform your life and bless you and keep you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.